probably noticed as you meditate that the mind has lots of minds, lots of different opinions on things, lots of different desires, often in conflict. And that's a major problem, but you want to learn how to turn it to your advantage. Because after all, suppose you did just have one self that was all confused, basically corrupt in its motives. You couldn't do anything to straighten yourself out. You'd have to wait for some help from outside. But if you look around in this committee you have in the mind, you find that there are all kinds of selves in here, some of which are skillful in one area, others are skillful in another area. And so you want to learn how to train them to work together, take advantage of the strengths of the individual members. Years back in high school, I remember reading the Odyssey. For English class, an English teacher made a really interesting point. She said, "You look at the Iliad. There's no one hero. It has lots of different people working together, and each of them has a different strength. Some of the members of the Greek army are physically strong; others are intelligent. They're not so strong, but they are intelligent." And the strong members learn how to listen to the intelligent ones, and the intelligent ones learn how to assist the strong ones. That's how they come out ahead, recognizing that each member of the army has his strength, and you want to take advantage of all the various strengths together instead of running off at cross purposes. And it's the same with the mind. You've got the part of the mind that likes to imagine. You've got the part of the mind that likes to stick to facts, the part of the mind that has desires, the part of the mind that goes more with anger. And what you want to learn how to do is train them. For example, the issues of craving and the conceit. We all know that craving and conceit can cause a lot of trouble, but there's a passage where Venerable Ananda points out that you do need a certain amount of craving and a certain amount of conceit in order to practice at all. The craving comes from hearing that there are other people who have been able to put an end to suffering, and you want that end of suffering as well. That's a healthy craving. You want to encourage it. As for conceit, you hear there are other people able to do this, and you say to yourself, well, why can't I? And there may be the the selves inside yourself that tend to be detractors and say, oh, you can never do this. Those are not the ones you want to listen to. You want to listen to the one that has a little bit of conceit and says, yes, I can do this. That's the voice inside you want to encourage. So you want to take advantage of all these different identities that you've learned how to take on. But you also have to be careful. Because it's very easy when you slip into a particular identity that you're going to bring along the weaknesses as well. This is why you want to create a good forum where the different members can sit down and talk to one another, and where they can show themselves for what they are, i.e. you have to get the mind quiet. Teach it how to settle down with just one object. And then when issues come up, bring the mind to that quiet spot, pose the question, whatever the issue may be, the decision you want to make, and then just put that question aside and go back to that quiet spot. Settle in as much as you can. And then at the end of the meditation, when you come out, you might give yourself five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, to contemplate whatever the issue may be. And you put the mind in a much better position to figure out which voice is actually the voice you want to listen to. Because it's not just the content of the different voices in the mind. 
It's also the tone of voice. And the more quiet you've had, the more clearly you can hear that tone. It's like the difference between listening to a, an old recording with lots of scratches, very narrow frequency range, and a much more modern recording where you've got a much wider range, less noise. So meditation is not just a matter of getting the mind to be quiet, but it's also a matter of learning how to listen to these voices. So you can start figuring out, who do you want to trust? And which particular voice can you depend on for a particular problem? This also means that it's not the case that you're going to wait until your powers of concentration are fully developed before you're going to start developing the potential for discernment, wisdom in your practice. The two go hand in hand. The more quiet you get the mind, the more clearly you can see things. The more clearly you see things, the more skill you can have, the more you begin to notice disquiet in different places in the mind. And so you want to work on these two qualities together. And of course, life doesn't allow you to just say, okay, I'm going to put all your issues aside until your powers of concentration are fully developed, and then we're going to entertain them, because life brings up certain issues unscheduled, without asking your permission. Issues come up dealing with this person and that, these choices or those choices you have to make. So you make use of what you've got. It's like going down to the gym. You want to be nice and strong, but you can't say, well, I'll wait until my body is nice and strong and then I'll go to the gym. Or I'll wait and train in my body for a different body before I develop it. You've got to develop what you've got. And it's in developing what you got that you get what you want, or get to the place where you want. So the concentration improves the chances of making a wise choice. But in and of itself, it's not going to guarantee wisdom. You also have to know which questions to ask. That really basic one the Buddha recommend. What one I do what will be to my long term welfare and happiness, what one I do will be to my long term harm and suffering. The wisdom there is on many levels. To begin with, it makes you, shows that you realize that happiness and suffering will depend on your actions, your choices. So you've got to be careful. It also shows that you know that it's the long term that matters, and not just the quick fix. So if an issue comes up and you're trying to decide what to do with it, you might ask yourself, well, suppose I was on my deathbed, I was looking back at my life, and I was thinking about the decision I made at this particular juncture. Which decision will I wish I had made? That helps you see things in the long term. But that question, what might I do would be lead to my long term welfare and happiness, it goes a little bit deeper. Listen to those terms, my long term welfare and happiness. They correspond to the three characteristics. My brings up the question of self and not self. Long term brings up the question of whether things are constant or not. Welfare and happiness brings up the issue of suffering and happiness, suffering and pleasure, stress and ease. And the question gives you a context for employing those perceptions. The Buddha never talks about three characteristics. The actual term does not appear in the Pali Canon. It's there in the commentaries, and it's all over Buddhist writings. But the Buddha himself never mentioned he talks about these things as three perceptions. And basically, there are three questions you ask about anything you're going to do. This action I'm going to do, what kind of results does it lead to? Are they going to be long-term or not? 
are they going to be stressful or pleasant? And the question is, if they're, if they're going to be stressful, why would I want to do them? If they're going to be painful, why would I want to do them? Those are those questions on an everyday basis. As you get deeper and deeper into the mind, you begin to see that there are certain things you identify with. And you ask yourself, this identification I have, is this lasting or is it short-term? Is it stressful or is it pleasant? And is that stress long-term or is the pleasure long-term? For instance, you start looking at the different pleasures you have in life and you begin to realize that some of them are conflicting with your peace of mind. Well, which pleasure would you rather go with? Peace of mind is something lasting, deep. Here we're speaking in relative terms. The concentration is a much longer lasting, much less harmful form of pleasure than the usual pleasures that we go around indulging in. It doesn't take anything away from anyone else, doesn't leave us intoxicated or bleary-eyed. Because there are a lot of pleasures out there that require that we close our eyes to the harm we're doing if we're going to continue having that pleasure, continue pursuing it. But this isn't that kind of pleasure. You can be clear-eyed and enjoy it. So you ask yourself, which of these two pleasures would I prefer? And as you pursue the pleasure of concentration, you begin to realize there are different levels of concentration. Well, which ones do you want to pursue to try to get deeper, more solid? Again, the question is, which is more lasting, which is more pleasant? You go with the one that's more lasting and pleasant. Until ultimately you reach the limits of concentration. At this point, you don't throw it away, but you simply ask yourself, is this as good a thing as it gets, or could it get better? And you begin to realize that even the pleasure of concentration is inconstant. And you start looking for something that goes beyond that. And this is the point where you stop identifying with the concentration. And if you've handled it well up to that point, you realize at that point you don't have anything else that you could hold on to. That's when you totally let go. So you take that question, what will be to my long-term welfare and happiness? What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And as you pursue it, it leads to these questions around the three perceptions, perceiving the inconstancy in things, perceiving the stress. And they're perceiving that because they are in constant stressful, they're not you, not yours, nothing you'd want to hold on to. And that insight goes in deeper and deeper levels. And as your concentration gets stronger, you begin to see more refined levels of pleasure, more lasting levels of pleasure than you'd known before. And that helps you let go of the, the types of pleasures that interfere with that that are not as satisfying. And to ultimately reach the point where you can let go of any form of concentration. Because concentration contains the most subtle levels of the aggregates that we chanted about just now. Form, feeling, perception, mental fabrication, consciousness. It's all there in the concentration. When you learn how to let go of the most subtle levels, then you're totally free. But you can do this only if you've mastered them. It's not the case where you say, well, I've had a little bit of concentration and I'm beyond that, I'm not going to get stuck on it. That's not letting go of the concentration. Because the strategy of the path is to get you focused more and more on higher levels of pleasure, more subtle levels of pleasure, you get more and more sensitive. In doing that, you're not only sensitive to the pleasure, but you're also more and more sensitive to the movements of the mind. You begin to see what you're doing as you deal with sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, ideas. 
in and of the heightened sensitivity. That's when you detect really subtle things that are going on. You see the intentional element there, and that's when you can let go. So the Buddha doesn't teach us to be afraid of concentration. He says, this is the path you've got to follow. And he doesn't say, well, keep following just the path of concentration and we'll work ab worry about insight later. You develop all the factors of the path together. He said, the more subtle the insight, the more subtle your concentration. The more subtle your concentration, the more subtle the insight. These two qualities help each other. It's like washing your hands. Your left hand washes your right hand, your right hand washes your left hand. That way they both get clean. And as you use your concentration, even just dealing with everyday problems, try to use your concentration. Get the mind as still as you can and ask yourself, how do I handle this particular issue? And the decision that comes out of a still mind is more likely to be a wise decision, a more clear-eyed decision, than one that comes when the mind is running around can't make up its mind about things. That's because as the mind settles down, all these different voices in the mind can be heard more clearly. And with time you begin to sense which of the voices you can trust with different matters. And you hear the comments that one voice will make on another voice. Then you'll be in a better position to decide which one you believe in. Well, if you can get them to work together, so much the better. As John Lee once said, the sign of a wise person is someone who can take anything and get good use out of it. So look at the Buddha. He says, we can even take our conceit and craving get good use out of it. Be careful of the drawbacks. Because conceit and craving can cause a lot of problems. But if you learn how to use them when they're helpful, you're that much further ahead.